So, that was uh, pretty stupid. <laughs> um, I use OBS for my live streaming tool. So what happened is that I started OBS and then I uh, selected like the stream to start uh, streaming. But there's like two buttons. One button says select stream and another says select stream and go live immediately. And they look very much alike. Um, and so I pressed the wrong one <laughs> and then basically there's no way back. Um, and the worst case, you have to like cancel the stream and plan a new one in YouTube Studio. So I thought like, okay, you know what? Never mind. Um, we'll just uh, deal with it. Um, so we're a bit earlier than planned, but uh, I think we'll, we'll do fine. And um, I'm sure we'll uh, take more than half an hour. So the people joining at eight a bit later will uh, still be able to uh, ask their questions. So welcome everybody. Thanks for joining tonight. Uh, great to chat with you again. I really like doing these live streams. I think it's a lot of fun actually also playing around with the live stream software and setting up everything. I have to think about adding some like cool uh, effects and uh, things like that to spice it up a little bit. So um, I, I'm going to think about uh, what I can do, like having some nice overlays and uh, maybe some music and uh, things like that. I don't want this to turn into a game stream or something, which is, of course, a lot more extreme. Uh, it's still about uh, asking questions and talking about software design, but uh, I think it could be fun. So uh, I'll look into that. Um, so how is everybody doing? Where, where are you from, actually? Just post where, you, where are you from. From Brazil, ah, it's 2.30 p.m. Okay, nice, nice. Uh, Jonas, yeah, I do need a catchphrase, actually. Uh, the the thing is, I'm a bit afraid that if, if I just think of something that it's going to be like uh, fake or something, you know? Uh, I know there's like a couple of YouTubers that have this like cool catchphrase at the beginning, but uh, I'm still out of inspiration. So if you have any ideas for a cool catchphrase, do let me know in the chat and then I can uh, think about it. All right, I see India, UK, Iceland, Florida, England, Canada. Wow, that's great. From everywhere, basically. Iran, Poland. Nice, nice, very nice. And even from the Netherlands. Oh, that's very good. We actually, we still have some Dutch people here. Um, awesome, awesome. All right. What I'd like to do today is just uh, go through your questions. I have a few questions uh, that you posted as a reply to uh, my community post on YouTube. So I'll just uh, go through those as well and then hope to answer as many questions as possible. If you have a question, just post it in the chat and I'll try to answer as many questions as possible. So, all right, I want to get started by already some of the questions you asked in the beginning. Um, in the beginning of the chat session. So I'm going to start just at the top. Uh, and that's a question by T, Mr. T, is that Mr. T? Where specifically would you use threading over async IO? Okay, that's a good question. Um, so the way I look at, there's basically, f let's say three different ways of dealing with um, um, concurrency or parallel uh, programming in Python. You have the, uh, the, the threading library, you have uh, the processing uh, library, and you have AsyncIO, right? Um, I'd say AsyncIO is kind of more of a modern variant of threading and processing, but it also has a bit of a different kind of um, uh, approach to multi-threading, I'd say. Um, <clears throat> The idea of threading is that you have multiple worker threads that are doing things uh, concurrently, right? Um, but, uh, and, and this can be helpful, for example, if you are processing uh, multiple streams of data at once and you want these things to listen to some port and get, uh, get data and do some processing in, uh, concurrently, then this works fine. Uh, where things become problematic, and that's also why uh, more asynchronous programming has become more popular, is that you often have a kind of sequence of things that you want to do. For example, uh, in essence, you have a combination of things that you want to basically be run concurrently, uh, but you also want to be able to respond to things. This is especially the case if you're, for example, interacting with the database. Uh, often, 
you know, you want to do some database request, get some data or update something in the database, and then you want to take another action like, I don't know, if you're building an API, for example, you want to send a response with that data, with the updated data, or maybe you want to do some security checks before you actually write something, which also are perhaps asynchronous operations. So for doing that kind of thing, using threads is actually really cumbersome because if you have to like start a new thread every time you want to do that, it becomes really annoying and your code really gets bloated. Um, now in, for example, a, a, a language like JavaScript, uh, initially this was done with callback functions, right? So if you open a file, if you read somewhere from a database, you have to supply like an incomplete and an on error function. Uh, which works, but that also quickly leads to something called callback hell, because you need to often do those things in sequence. And then you're going to get this very deeply nested series of function calls that in each complete, you're doing another thing that has itself another incomplete, et cetera, et cetera. So that's where um, asynchronous programming can really help. And the, the whole idea behind this is that you have a promise, which is actually an, an object, that has, an, let's say, an incomplete and on error kind of, I'm kind of simplifying things here a bit, but because it's an object uh, and there is some syntax extension in Python with the await and async syntax, you can actually treat concurrent code as almost like normal code. You just have to remember to put await uh, in front of it and put async in front of a function or method that calls uh, asynchronous functions. So. That means it's a lot simpler to do these kinds of operations. So I'd say threading versus async to me feels really like, okay, threading is a bit more old fashioned. If you just need to have uh, workers that do things concurrently, you don't really worry about uh, responding to what they're doing. For example, you want something that computes analytics of something every hour or so you can uh, use a worker thread. But if you need to do something with the data, if you need to do a sequence of things, then overall async IO is a much better option. And that's normally, I actually almost never use threads myself. I just use uh, asynchronous programming in uh, everything that I do. Um, uh, then you also have the, uh, the issue in Python, of course, with the global interpreter log that Python is actually not really uh, doing uh, things uh, concurrently, but that it's, um, uh, um, uh, but that it's uh, kind of pretending. <laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, if, if you really want to benefit from uh, concurrency in Python, you should probably look closer at uh, uh, processing, which actually starts uh, extra uh, new processes, which are handled uh, concurrently because that happens on the OS level. All right, um, let's see. Nico asks, will there be another sale for your senior developer course? I'm sure there will be at some point in the future. I, we haven't really planned anything yet, so uh, uh, not for a while. Uh, Yitu ask, how to transition to a new role if you have no specific experience in that role? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, so you probably know the phrase, uh, <laughs> fake it until you make it. It's kind of true, but uh, of course, I think what you're referring to is more about the content and how you're actually, um, if, if you want to transition to a new role, what's, what do you need to learn? How do you ensure that you're actually taking the right steps to get there? So of course, it depends very much on the kind of role it is. Is it like related to what you're doing, then you can probably extrapolate and think about what you need to learn in order to, uh, to do it. Um, if it's very different, yeah, then I would definitely start looking for, I don't know, some kind of uh, mentor or person that can give you some advice on how to make that transition. I mean, it also very much depends on the type of role it is. If you move from, I don't know, uh, software development to uh, sales, or uh, you're moving more into management position, which I think a lot of software developers are doing later in their career, um, then what you can try is see if it's possible that in your current role, you're already trying some of those new tasks. So for example, if, if you transition into more of a management position as a software developer, well, you could already see if you can supervise an intern 
for example, or um, or do a, a bit more of the things that you would do in a management job, like uh, writing a feature document and asking your employer if it's possible to already get started doing those things. All right. Uh, how should I go, Adam asks, how should I go with test-driven development with design patterns? Ignore design patterns until refactoring phase or actively prepare tests for final objects. Yeah, so the whole idea, of course, of test-driven development is that you only write the code that makes your tests pass. And then if you've done that, then basically that means that the application is done if you defined your tests correctly, of course, which is a whole other uh, type of uh, challenge that you have to deal with. Um, yeah, the way that it works for me with design patterns is I don't really explicitly think about them anymore. It's like it becomes kind of second nature. Once you've used them for a while, they tend to pop up automatically uh, when you're looking for a certain type of solution. And there's no reason to first write crappy code if you can also use design pattern. It won't take much more time to use a design pattern instead of hacking something together. So, <clears throat> for example, a pattern that I like to use a lot is the strategy, which in essence is just passing a function to another function. It's a higher order function. I use those all the time and I don't really think about it. I don't really think, hey, I should first hack some, something together and then I'm actually going to do it properly. Um, it's, it's like when you know how to use the tools and this just takes some uh, some experience, then you will start automatically using them in the right place. So you don't, you don't really have to think about it. Of course, refactoring you will always do because you will always realize that um, a certain way of approaching the problem that you thought about doesn't really work like you intended. So uh, then you have to change things. But I don't think you should explicitly avoid design patterns in the beginning, especially not design principles, which are even more important than the patterns that are based on them. All right, let's see. Um, I see there's a couple of more questions. Um, Miguel asks, do you have good resources besides your videos to learn the fundamentals about object-oriented programming in general and in Python? Um, at the moment, uh, not really, because I tend to focus more on, let's say, the intermediate level. So in my videos and most of the content that I make myself, I tend to assume that people know about basic things like object-oriented programming. Uh, there's lots of uh, introductory courses out there. There's tons and tons of videos on YouTube explaining those concepts. I'm, I'm sure if you type object-oriented programming in Python uh, on YouTube, you're, you're going to find like uh, loads of uh, courses that are going to help you. I don't have a specific uh, a creator in mind to help you, but there are, are lots uh, out there. Um, that's also the reason that I don't do the beginner stuff because there's already so much material available. So I feel like I can help more in uh, the, the step that comes after that. Danny asks, what are your thoughts on test-driven development? Can we afford something less than 100% coverage? Well, yes, I think um, I think there's always going to be an area of your code that's that's going to be really hard to test. I mean, most companies that I know of, at least, don't really force their developers to reach 100% coverage. It, it also depends on your goal, of course, because if you're a company and you're developing a product, then reaching 100% coverage is maybe a really nice uh, software development goal, but your customers are probably not going to notice the difference between 80% coverage and 100% coverage. Of course, it might be there might be a bug sometimes that you might have caught if you uh, aimed for 100% coverage, but it's like the Pareto principle, like uh, where um, you spent uh, uh, at some point for to get that last 20% of your code covered, you need to spend 80% of the time because that's just really a complex and difficult areas of your code. And 
Another thing is that you can also investigate other ways of testing your application. You, you don't need to just write unit tests, which is where coverage is, of course, playing a role. I mean, you also have end-to-end uh, -end tests, for example, that don't know anything about the code at all, but that still test your system as a whole. So also do, don't discount the value that those kind of tests bring to the table. So in the end, my feeling is that 100% um, coverage, it, I don't think that should be a goal. I think you should find a careful balance uh, between uh, spending uh, not too much time on writing the code so that you can still deliver results fast, but use the different testing methodologies for different purposes. So uh, things that can be easily unit tested, write unit tests for them, go for it. Uh, you can even rely on some uh, design principles and patterns to decouple things so that you can make writing those tests easier. I think there's a lot that you can win by doing that a bit carefully. But also don't worry too much about it uh, because coverage also doesn't say, any, say everything, right? Um, I mean, you can write a test that uh, basically covers all of your code, but that doesn't actually test your program because it doesn't actually test whether it work, whether it does what it's supposed to do. So don't get too hung up either on that number of reaching 100% coverage because you you might start writing tests just to get to 100%, which don't make a lot of sense. Um, all right, uh, Pacers Go is MVC still popular in desktop app development? or are there better variations than the classic model view controller? Actually, I use it still quite a lot. I think it's quite a generic pattern that you can basically apply in, a co in several different ways. Depends a bit on how your uh, UI library is set up also. But I always find it helpful to uh, think about models, views, and controllers. And uh, when I develop a GUI application, I do often use that pattern. Uh, there's not always a model. Uh, it depends if you're uh, simply writing, let's say, a light client that just interacts with a couple of APIs, uh, then uh, there's not really a model. Then you mostly have view controller. And of course, you have uh, variations, like uh, Django does something slightly different. Uh, but overall, the idea of uh, making sure that your uh, GUI code doesn't contain business logic I think that's a good approach uh, to start with. All right, another question by Danny Hauer. Solid principles applied to functional programming? Well, uh, they're not really, because solid is really coming from object-oriented design. So uh, you can probably translate some aspects of solid to functional programming. I mean, in the end, you're using the concepts of language to do your work, right? And uh, things like single responsibility, you can kind of translate that to if you're, if you're writing a function that you don't want that function to have hundreds of lines that do all kinds of different things. So I think the ideas behind the, um, these solid principles, you can definitely um, sometimes translate them, but not always. Um, I mean, the Liskov substitution problem, for example, is uh, highly dependent on there being inheritance, which uh, you don't have with functional programming. So that's kind of hard to translate. So I tend to not focus too much on uh, these specific sets of object-oriented principles. Also because myself, I'm moving a bit more towards using functional concepts. So I tend to stick with the design principles that are behind um, uh, these pattern, more generic things like um, uh, low coupling, high cohesion, separating, creation from use, those kinds of things. I find them more helpful. <coughs> uh, Yuri, what's the best place to make money with Python? Uh, YouTube? <laughs> no, uh, maybe not YouTube. Well, I think there's many Python jobs. I mean, Python is one of the most popular programming language, I think mainly in the data science and um, uh, machine learning domain, which are both really popular domains. So I think if you want to make money, if you want to earn a living with Python, then those areas are uh, good 
start. Um, I think Python is also used a lot in, um, let's say, automation, scripts, uh, DevOps. We are at my company using uh, Python a lot for DevOps. So uh, that's also a good place to look into. Um, yeah, you have to think about uh, what your goal is. I mean, is your goal really to make money? Then you can maybe better start working at a bank and don't do anything with Python. Uh, if you uh, want to focus on Python, I think it's more important to f find a job that puts you in a learning position. So don't think about what makes the most money. Don't, I wouldn't optimize for that. I would optimize for what results in the most personal growth for me. Where, where do I learn the most things? Because every skill that you learn compounds and you can use it again to learn other new things that will propel you further. So I always try myself to optimize for that path and not for the path of how can I make more money? Because I feel like it also doesn't really make me very happy if I optimize just for making more money. Um, I think like lots of things in life, this is a personal journey you're going through and um, optimize for that and make it fun. Uh, right. Um, any thoughts about Python with Rust? I haven't combined them. I'm, I am interested in Rust. I'd like to investigate a bit more and see if I can do some uh, content about it on the channel. I've already said that like three or four times, but still not doing it. But uh, it might definitely be uh, be interesting. I don't have any specific uh, ideas about it now. All right, uh, Danny, what are your thoughts on uh, testing infrastructure as code with tools like TerraTest? I haven't used uh, TerraTest myself. I think in part, if you're doing infrastructure as code, you can, um, uh, well, it depends. I mean, if you're using Terraform, then you still, uh, then that's probably TerraTest that you should use. But if you're using something like Pulumi, where you write your infrastructure in Python, uh, you can actually use the uh, regular Python libraries for unit testing, like PyTest or the built-in unit test system, especially if you, um, if you use things like dependency injection, you can take your code that generates your uh, cloud infrastructure and actually test it like regular code, which I think is really nice. All right, Infitex Visions asks, should I move further away from front-end framework, CRA, uh, Next.js, and try setting up Webpack everything myself? Um, I was looking at work on my software development team and they approach it this way. Yeah, um, I'm, I would say try to avoid having to set up everything by yourself. It starts to get pretty complicated, especially if you want to do things like server-side rendering in the front-end app and uh, hydration and all that kind of stuff. Um, also, you have to wonder what's, what's your purpose of doing that yourself? Is it just to learn it? Well, then um, maybe it's better to not do that as part of your uh, company project, but do it like um, in a side project or something. I am typically try to avoid uh, doing stuff that other people already did a much better job at than, uh, than I did. Uh, in the past, I also made uh, mistakes there. I, I think in one of the first companies that I started, we kind of started building everything from scratch because we thought we were so much better than those existing platforms. Well, of course, we weren't. And it just took us a lot of time to build something really basic. And uh, we just lost a lot of time because of that. If you want results faster, use those frameworks and don't bother uh, trying to create all that stuff on your own. It's generally, in my opinion, a waste of time. Uh, Danny, what are your thoughts on clean code? By Uncle Bob, should we really be that strict when we develop code or can we avoid things by compromising? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I've, uh, I've read both uh, clean code and clean architecture. Clean code is already a while ago, so I have to uh, recall some of the details. I mean, I'm a pretty pr practical person, um, kind of uh, opportunistic almost when I'm writing software. So it depends very much 
on what what is what the purpose is of the software that I'm writing. If I'm just writing a quick script to I don't know extract some uh, data quickly from a JSON file and do some processing and uh, output it to another file, I'm not really that concerned by with writing uh, very clean code and making sure that I can uh, test everything because it's just a simple script. So I think you should really not so much optimized for clean code because we also know the reality of uh, working as a software developer. There are just deadlines. You need to finish things on time. So it's not always possible. And what clean code means can also change because as you're refactoring things, you're moving around things, it means that some code that was clean before, after you refactor it, it's no longer clean because you had to, uh, uh, I don't know, temporarily uh, put lots of things in the same function to keep things uh, working and then you have to clean it up again. So how far you take it, I think that depends on your, your practical circumstances. I think it's, it's good to, keep, to always keep these ideas in mind when you develop code and try to do a good job. I think another thing that Uncle Bob also says in his books, I don't remember if that's in clean code or in clean architecture, but he calls that the Boy Scout principle, which means that if you work on a piece of code, try to leave it in a better state than uh, it was before you started working on it. And <clears throat> I think that's a good principle to follow. Um, it's also realistic because it also means that your code is not going to be perfect always and there's always things to improve and uh, that's totally fine um, as long as you keep in mind that when you revisit the code you can spend some time improving things. Uh, Andrew, what things will you consider when deciding hosting options? Uh, hosting options for what? For a website, for uh, 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 your server or things like that. Uh, I tend to uh, look at the main uh, cloud providers and um, they mostly do the same thing nowadays. Uh, there's a lot of overlap. I don't think, uh, well, I mean, there's some areas where uh, Amazon is better than uh, Google. There are some price differences, of course, that you can look into. Uh, personally, I tend to stick with the cloud provider that I know how to use because then I'm sure that I can get results faster. And in my case, that's Google Cloud. I worked most with Google Cloud. I do have some experience with Azure and with AWS and a little bit with uh, Heroku. But um, I find the difference between them is disappearing fast. Um, for me, uh, Google Cloud works fine, so I normally start there. Uh, there's one issue, by the way, with Google Cloud, and that is they have, um, if you're using uh, Cloud Run, which uh, starts uh, Docker containers uh, on, the, on the fly, basically, uh, you have pretty long uh, cold start time. So uh, that's not so great. I think AWS is doing a much better job at that. So if you're using those things, I would definitely go, not go for Google Cloud, but go for AWS. Um, Danny, is it go is going full object oriented programming considered a bad mindset to have as a program? Should it be more open minded and combine object oriented programming and functional programming whenever needed? Um, I wouldn't call it a bad mindset per se. I mean, it's uh, I like object oriented programming for some type of problems, and I like a more functional approach for other types of problems. Um, I think object-oriented program was mostly very popular in the 90s. Uh, it also depends on your program language. I mean, if you're writing a C-sharp application, for example, well, you have no choice. Everything is object-oriented. So there you go. But so I would definitely not consider it a bad mindset. But if you have the ability, like in Python, to also use a more functional approach, well, it might sometimes lead to shorter code. Uh, while having uh, exactly the same result. So uh, I'm always a fan of that, um, assuming that it still is readable code. All right, uh, Jovit, can you please tell me what kind of skills you're expecting from a uh, middle Python developer? So yeah, it depends on the company, of course. Uh, everybody has their own definition of what a junior versus media versus senior developers should be able to do. Um, to me, it comes 
down to a lot of, ex let's say, experience with uh, drilling deeper into problems. So a junior developer, I think, is somebody that knows how to code. They, are, uh, they know uh, maybe one, maybe two programming languages, and they're able to produce code written in those languages. So you have to uh, kind of give them a specific job, <coughs> like uh, write a function that does that, or add a very simple feature that do does that very specific thing. Uh, the more senior you are, I think the more responsibility you can take for uh, also thinking about how everything fits together in the code. Um, and there's another line which is more, let's say, the management line, like are you able to manage people? That's more the difference between a regular software developer and the lead developer. So uh, that's kind of a different axis that you work on. But uh, the more senior you are, I'd say uh, the more uh, confident you are with programming languages, uh, you will as a senior developer probably know four or five or six, because once you know two or three, then uh, learning new programming languages is relatively easy, actually. But you'll also be able to work more independently and uh, be able to, uh, you know, uh, fix problems without uh, having to, to get very specific instructions to do so. So I think that's that's for me more the difference, like how independently can you work and, uh, and how complex are the uh, solutions that you can find when at, at what st stage do we need to step in, basically. All right. Um, another question, Danny, lots of questions from Danny. If I have knowledge on design patterns, solid, uh, clean, Code, uh, where, wait, I'm just scrolling down a bit uh, too fast. Um, I'm completely lost now, sorry. Oh, if I know it's on design patterns, solid clean code, test and do code reviews and mentoring sessions, can I be considered a senior? Well, the, I think the knowledge is part of it, definitely. Um, I think, like I said, part of what to me makes a senior developer is somebody that you can also give more responsibility. So it depends on, on your experience if, if that's your position in the company. Uh, Max asks, do you think uh, test-driven development takes more time on dev? Do you have any tips to have, to have more productivity with test-driven development? Uh, quite a few test-driven development uh, questions today. Um, I don't think it takes much more time, to be honest, uh, because you'll be spending less time chasing down bugs that you will have caught uh, much earlier in the process with test-driven development. Um, I also think that it's something that you get used to. So um, just like uh, with everything, if once you get used to it, you will become more efficient at it and uh, it will become easier. So I think just like applying design principles, using design patterns, this almost becomes like second nature. It's just, just your way of working. And uh, I don't think it necessarily takes, uh, takes more time. Um, now really sp more specific productivity tips. Yeah, use it more so you get more experience with it because that will uh, allow you to um, to do it faster and combine it with applying design principles. Uh, because if you do that, then your code is easier to test. And that means that right, once you think more in design principles, then actually conceiving the test before you write the code also becomes easier because you already have the design principles in mind. Um, Tatsuna, do you have any plans to actually start a game engine design uh, series or course in the future? So a series on YouTube, I don't think so. Uh, I might do a course. I don't think I would do uh, a, a paid course like I do my uh, software design course. I would maybe put it on Skillshare on, or some platform like that because it's a pretty specific topic. I do like it. I actually taught uh, game programming for quite a few years at the university. So uh, it's something that I uh, like to do. I've even written some books about them. Don't buy those books, they're kind of outdated, but 
it's it's fun to work on uh, on games and think about uh, the, the the design and architecture behind games. Um, all right, what do you think about uh, transactions on the surface layer? How to implement it clearly? Um, often uh, business logic needs uh, transactions, but we can make it only with a database driver. Uh, yeah, so databases are often transaction driven. That's true. Uh, I think that's also a good reason to use them. Actually, uh, I wouldn't implement that from scratch myself. I don't know if there are systems that do it without the, the database layer, actually. Um, I mean, one uh, pattern that comes to mind is the command pattern that also allows you to uh, connect patch up commands. So you could uh, think about setting up something like that. Um, I must admit, I haven't used that a lot myself. Um, I think it's uh, it's very common in finance to do those kinds of things in the kind of systems that I've built. I haven't encountered uh, systems where transactions were really important, to be honest. Uh, okay, Esteban, how can one explore, test, and actually learn about all the Dunder methods? I think you first need to start by thinking about why you need to learn about Dunder methods. You don't always need them. Um, if you need to implement a specific kind of functionality, then you might need some Dunder methods. For example, if you want to implement iterator behavior or uh, if you want to create a context manager. So I would focus it on the things that you, you want to do and then uh, consider which kinds of Dunder methods you might need for that. Uh, I try to honestly avoid them if I can because they feel like more a more low level thing to me. Sometimes they're very useful, but sometimes you can also uh, get away with not using them. All right, Dennis asks, Java is usually taught in my school. What do you think I should learn besides that? Is Java a good language? Oh boy, that's uh, opening a can of worms. Um, I don't think Java is such a good language anymore. I mean, I think it was a very valuable and great language in the 90s when uh, basically all you had was like C++ or... Uh, um, uh, like a very early version of uh, JavaScript that didn't really work. So Java was really the new language that allowed you to develop things cross-platform. Well, it didn't really work out that way because uh, it was still kind of cumbersome to use. I also think uh, Java is quite verbose, uh, especially, uh, you know, uh, with uh, the... Uh, it's also purely object-oriented, which is part of the problem, but also I think modern languages, they have a uh, more shorter, terser way of expressing things. So I wouldn't call it a bad language uh, because it was actually a really good language, especially at the time. It, it, Java has been a really important stepping stone also in uh, uh, creating other languages that's improved on it. So uh, I think that's also important to note. It's all part of history, right? If I were starting out today as a software developer, I wouldn't particularly choose Java. I think there are better, simpler, nicer options out there, even including Python. Um, okay, Jose. Jose, how would you approach unit testing code that's only able to run on an end-to-end -end environment, like testing for a Kafka message being sent? Um, yeah, so I think when you write your unit test, you, you have to think about how you can split things out. And there's often more possible than you think. Like, for example, if you're testing for a Kafka message being sent, how does your application code um, match the, um, uh, uh, the, 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 the Kafka API? Where does that connection happen? And uh, can you like split that out so that you can still test your code without having that API connection? Um, other than that, the unit testing and code that ha is in an end-to-end -end environment is really complicated because you have all these services that are attached to it. So the only way to really solve that in the unit testing environment is to uh, actually separate out those things, decouple those things, uh, use dependency injection to do that. And you can often get further than you think. 
Um, oh, welcome, uh, yeah, new member, very good. Um, and uh, let's see, uh, Matthew, thank you so much. Thanks for all the amazing content support. Thank you, man, that's great. All right, let's go for a few more questions. I see that there is, uh, what can I do? All right, just a minute, I'm going to scroll up again. Let me go through a few questions that were posted in uh, as a response to my uh, post, community post today. Um, so I'm going to start with a question by Sil. What Python packages do you like most that help with good software development and design? What I try to look for is packages that uh, have proper type hints. I feel type hints help me in uh, writing code faster and getting a better understanding of how everything fits together. Um, now, I don't know of particular packages that are really focused on helping with design. I mean, you have like packages that help with dependency injection, things like that, but I feel like dependency injection is already something that's built into the language, so I don't really use those packages all that much. I do like Funk Tools, uh, the built-in package into Python because it allows for some extra flexibility with functions like uh, partial function application, which I like a lot. So those types of packages I really tend to, uh, tend to use, and I think they really help also with design because they make uh, the functional part of Python more powerful. Um, yeah, next question in the community chat. So, uh, Swolbaster asks how to deal with the imposter syndrome. Yeah, this is, uh, of course, happening in all kinds of different positions. Um, I also deal with imposter syndrome, to be honest. I mean, it it's, tends to become worse if you are somebody that publishes content like I do. Uh, you, you, yeah, you sometimes get like negative comments or people picking really on the details. So um, being a YouTuber also helps train your immunity for those kind of things. I actually don't mind people being critical. I think it's great if people are critical. But uh, you have to let go of, of your ego and taking things personal. Um, I, th I think that's, for me, that's been the the best thing to on, on how to deal with the imposter syndrome. Really focus not so much on, hey, what do people think about me, but focus more really on uh, your own progress and uh, the, the, the steps that you take in your, in your learning path. And basically what happens then is that you are competing with yourself because every time you learn something new, you actually become better at something. And nowadays, if, if you really take that to the next level, then you actually start looking forward to receiving criticism because you get this feeling, oh, hey, I'm about to learn something. I'm, I'm about to become better than what I was before. So I'm, I'm trying to actually actively look for those things. Even though it feels uncomfortable, it, it really, really helps. Identity of Marcus, currently studying software developer embedded systems. I really like Python, so any good tips on frameworks that I should learn? Uh, I haven't built embedded systems myself, so I'm sorry, I can't really help you with that. But maybe somebody in the chat has some suggestions for you. Rodrigo, uh, as a mid-level programmer who's always trying to sharpen my skills, sometimes I get overwhelmed with all the possibilities. Um, reading more books, dive deeper into the Python language, learn new languages, working on side projects. Do you have any thoughts or experience regarding these feelings? In other words, how to clarify what subject approaches the best call for any given moment in your life or career. It's, it's really one of the hardest things to do, to be honest. It's really easy to get caught in a kind of tutorial hell or where you're just you know, infinitely looking up things and uh, 
trying to, uh, you know, figure out what the next thing is that you're supposed to learn. And then you're buying more books and then you're doing more courses. And it's it can become like a thing where you feel like, okay, now I'm completely lost and uh, I need to do so many things. I don't know where to start. I think that's a very frustrating position to be in. Um, to me, that's kind of happened a bit when I was just finishing my computer science studies. Uh, there was a master's studies and then I wanted to do a PhD in computer graphics, but there was just so much stuff to learn about that I felt like completely lost. And what really helped me put my feet back on the ground is to really do not worry too much about all the things that you're going to have to learn because that's just going to be way too much, but really focus it on more specific projects and uh, and take it step by step. Don't don't worry too much about that. You have to become a senior developer. Set realistic goals for yourself and and do that step by step so you can become better one step at a time. And if you keep it specific, then you it's also easier to stay in the moment of things and um, uh, and then you don't have to uh, worry too much, uh, you know, about uh, doing a hundred different uh, tutorials. Keep it close to uh, the actions that you take. Because in the end, I feel like a lot of learning that happens uh, mostly if you're actually doing the thing and not so much reading about the thing. Uh, to give you an example, I started a company in, with, a, um, with an ex-colleague of mine in 2016. And uh, well, we basically completely failed, even though we read like 10 books about running startups, etc. cetera. Um, but, uh, you know, reading doesn't really, uh, I mean, it's useful. I read a lot of books, but it's not, uh, reading doesn't work if you don't actually also apply the knowledge and see what happens. All right, a uh, few other questions in the chat. So, um, uh, geschenk papier. Should methods always return true or false to indicate success failure of an operation? Uh, there's uh, lots of different ways to indicate the success or failure of an oper oper operation. I think you should pick one way to do it, ideally. Um, you can do that with exceptions. Uh, you can do that with uh, a true or false return statement. But the, the thing is that if you're using return values like uh, Booleans to indicate whether it was successful or not, you will have a problem uh, with a method that has to return a value because then uh, how do you return whether the whether the operation was successful or not? So that's that's kind of hard. And that's why a lot of people rely more on exceptions instead to cover those kind of things. So if something goes wrong, you raise an exception and then you can handle that exception outside of the normal flow. Now that's also a problem with exceptions because it's a separate flow in your program. It can become confusing and that's where uh, things like monadic error handling come in. And what that basically means is that you have your method called, but it doesn't return one value, it actually returns two values. It returns a, uh, the actual value that the method is supposed to return, but it also returns a success or failure flag. And it's also called railroad programming because you have these two like rails where one is the, the the, the program actually that returns the result and that calls the next function and the other one is whether you're in the success or failure state and then if something goes wrong you move to the rail of failure. Um, so that's another way of approaching it. Uh, I, th I, I, th I really like it but I think uh, it's still a bit too early. I think that we still need to work a bit on um, maybe better integrating those things into uh, the Python language specifically. All right, um, a few more questions. I'm just going to scroll down a bit. I, um, yeah, ask tips on uh, how to behave in the first month of a Django internship. Um, well, it depends uh, how you want to uh, close your internship, <laughs> if you uh, want to stay or if you want to leave. Um, I'd say uh, use it as a uh, really a good place to learn. You will probably be surrounded by uh, 
couple of people that are going to be more senior than you. That's a really privileged place to be in. Um, uh, and, and try to extract as much knowledge as possible from them. I remember my own internship. It was at the university, so it was a bit different. But for me, it was really valuable. It really changed the way that I, I thought about programming and software development because it was so much more hands-on than what I learned during my studies. And it really made me realize like uh, how many really smart people there are out there that I can learn from. So try to create an environment where you can basically suck up all that information and, uh, and, and, and benefit from that because the position of internship you're not going to have um, uh, uh, many times. So it's, it's a really valuable experience. So use that. Um, oh, another question for me, how to manage working remotely with life, wife and Jim? Yeah, it's, uh, it has changed a lot, of course, in the last years with COVID on how people work remotely. I think for a lot of software developers, actually working remotely is really, really nice. I mean, you do miss sometimes the interaction with the team. With my company, we have a developer that actually works fully remotely. I've met him in person only once, so that uh, took some getting used to. Uh, but we actually manage pretty well. and. Uh, I mean, the, the advantage of if you have, if you really work at a company where working remotely is the norm, then it also often means that you have a bit more freedom because you'll be working from home. Uh, you know, you can take a, a, a short walk if you just want to get some fresh air or something. So I think uh, that's, um, uh, I think working remotely is actually easier. And the hard thing about working remotely is that you, still need to make sure that you're separating your personal life from your professional life. So the thing is that uh, if you work really from home, uh, you might start associating your home with work and that's not always healthy. So what you can do to avoid that is either designate really a specific place in your home where that's going to be your workplace. And then when you're done working, also don't go there anymore. But you need the space for that, of course. What you can also do is um, uh, don't work at home, but uh, go to a coffee place and then work there if possible. If you can work from a laptop, for example. So if you work from home, I think it, it's really great as software developer, but make sure that you provide some kind of mental separation between personal and workspace. Clayton, uh, why did you choose Python for making your YouTube videos? If you could expand into a different language for YouTube content, what would it be? Okay, that's an, uh, the second question is actually really easy for me to answer. If, if I were to expand in a different language, it would probably be TypeScript slash JavaScript, because that's what next to Python I have the most experience with. Uh, why did you choose Python? Well, uh, it kind of uh, happens sort of accidentally. I was teaching a course a couple of years ago on software design and we wanted to move it to Python. So I started playing around a bit with Python and uh, design principles and design patterns to build some examples for that course. Um, and uh, well, then I sort of realized that uh, there was not so much content about that specific area of Python. And um, I thought it was, was actually helpful. My students really liked it. So then I thought, hey, why not make some videos about it and explain it so that not just my students can learn that stuff, but uh, I can also explain it to other people on the internet. So that's how kind of my whole uh, YouTube channel started. So before that, funnily enough, I was not at all uh, like a Python expert or something. I wouldn't call myself that. Hey, there we have the imposter syndrome again. Anyway, um, but, you know, through making the videos, I actually also learned a lot about Python myself um, uh, and uh, learned more about what it means to, um, to do software design in Python. And it's kind of evolved in that way. And in the beginning of the channel, I actually didn't focus explicitly on Python. I also did one or two TypeScript videos, but 
I noticed it didn't really work that well by uh, if I didn't focus on a single language because then you had all these people in my audience that were uh, Pythonistas and then suddenly I do some TypeScript stuff and everybody's like, well, what are you doing? What's going on? So that didn't really work so well. So uh, it kind of happens, but actually I really also do like the language and I think it's it's really easy to use. I think it's it's growing every time, you know, there's a new version, there's a bunch of new stuff. So it's really in a language that's been actively worked on uh, with a very low threshold for uh, people to start to work with it. So for me, it's um, it's it's really a, a nice place uh, to, it's, it's a really nice language to work with. Um, Another question by, uh, yeah, do you develop uh, locally on a Mac M1? How is your setup? Yeah, so I use my, um, uh, I have a 16 inch MacBook Pro, that's an M1 Max. Now, uh, the reason I use an M1 Max is not so much for software development, but it's mainly for video editing, where the extra encoder and decoder chips are actually really useful. And of course, well, since I have a YouTube channel, I'm uh, doing a lot of spending a lot of time in Final Cut Pro. Um, I do develop uh, locally on the Mac as well, uh, which uh, I really like, so I use VS Code. Uh, I use uh, Docker a lot also uh, locally, so I, I have my Docker image uh, running uh, locally on my uh, M1 Mac. That doesn't always work uh, as expected because the, uh, the processor architecture is, is a bit different, of course, for Mac, so that leads to problems sometimes. So it's not ideal, I'd say, but I managed to kind of uh, work around that. So, um, for example, for my company, we have, uh, we, we develop a front-end application that's built with Next.js and that's all run in a local Docker container and that works actually perfectly fine. Uh, so that's uh, basically how I work, and that's, uh, that works well. All right, um, Building Khan, are you planning on doing more Python Dash videos? Uh, not currently planning that. Uh, I think uh, there were some people asking for how to deal with authentication in Dash uh, dashboards, so that might be an interesting topic to look into in the future. Um, uh, I might also look at some other tools like Streamlit and do a comparison. So there's some some ideas. I, I don't have something specifically planned at the moment. Um, all right, uh, let's see. Um, uh, Guillermo asks how to get motivated to study programming again. I worked for programming about 10 years, but lost motivation to study more. If you need motivation to study programming, I think the best way to approach it is, is, is to uh, define a project for yourself, uh, uh, something that you want to solve, maybe an application that you want to build, and then you're going to learn the things that you need to learn in order to achieve that. And then the motivation, if you choose the right project, then the motivation will flow from there. So maybe it's a project to help someone else uh, solve a particular problem, or uh, it's maybe a project to help you with a, a hobby that uh, motivates you. So start there. Um, all right, uh, Karasian asks, considering the amount of design patterns, it feels like you need to know all of them before you can even start. Are there some specific ones that are mostly used? Um, well, about the first part, it feels like you need to know them all. That's certainly not the case. Um, I don't think that I, even I don't know all the design patterns. You know, there's like a ton of them. Um, it also happens quite often that uh, you realize after the fact that you've apparently used a design pattern. Oh, wait, that's actually a design pattern. I didn't know that. Um, and but there are certainly a, a few specific ones that are really common. Uh, at, at least I've noticed that in my case. Um, uh, one that I use really quite a lot is the strategy, which I think I mentioned also in the beginning of the live stream is really a higher order function. It's nothing more than that. So if you pass a function to another function, and then uh, that's basically what a strategy pattern is. It allows you to swap out some behavior. So that one I use a lot. 
um, the um, a kind of factory like pattern I also tend to use quite a lot or at least I try to separate creating things from using them because it helps me write tests more easily um, so those are two that I, I use a lot I'd say and other than that I feel like I don't really focus that much on design patterns myself I tend to focus more on the principles so when I refactor or work on my code, I always try to think not so much about, hey, what design pattern could I use, but more about uh, terms like coupling and cohesion and uh, uh, how is it with responsibilities? Am I separating creation from use? Uh, maybe more general things like don't repeat yourself, keep things simple, those kinds of ideas. And there are less of those ideas than design patterns, so they're a bit easier to get started with. And they also apply to a wider variety of problems. All right, um, let's see a few more questions. I'm going to scroll back up again because I think I skipped uh, a few. Um, let's See, okay, Umang asks, Hi, Arjan, I tried to follow a coding pattern you discussed in one of the meetings. I end up writing a lot of code to do even simple things. How can I avoid this? Yeah, so a design pattern, I, I'm assuming you're referring to using a design pattern and that it actually leads to a lot of complication. So with design patterns, you have to be really careful that you're actually using it in a problem that is suitable for the design pattern. Uh, if you use it in a wrong way, if you basically pick the wrong pattern to solve your problem, then you're going to overcomplicate things because the problem is not going to fit in the mold that the design pattern provides. And I think that's also one of the main issues with design patterns that, especially in the beginning, if you're not yet really used to them, it's really hard to figure out, okay, what kind of design pattern am I supposed to use here? So what you can do to try and avoid some of the issues is that can you think a bit ahead of time? Let's say you have your, your current version of your code and you're thinking, hey, I'm, I'm going to, uh, it's, it's currently hard to test or it's currently hard to change. Uh, think about why that is. Why is it so hard to change? What's, why, why does refactoring uh, that code take so much time? Um, then that's going to lead you to hopefully an idea of where you could split things up a bit more and provide some separation. And then try to think, okay, what that looks maybe a bit like that design pattern, how would I actually implement that? And think it through before you start actually writing the code and move with moving everything around. And uh, especially if if you then take a next step and not just focus on object-oriented program, but you're also thinking maybe slightly more in a, in a functional way, thinking in terms of functions that use other functions, that can also often help you to write a bit shorter code instead of having all these classes and inheritance relationships everywhere. So try to think a few steps ahead. You can't always completely imagine it in your mind, but you can often get a rough idea of how complicated this is going to be and whether it's really going to be a good fit for solving your problem. Uh, another thing you can do is approaching it from the other side. So think more about um, when you're writing your code, think about, I, I, I tend to think about what, what happens if uh, that thing is uh, changed or what happens if I want to replace that library with something else or what happens if I need uh, more options of that particular piece of the code that I'm using and then try to think about what the consequences are going to be in terms of refactoring. And that also helps that kind of thing, you know, uh, taking those steps to um, uh, really think through how your code reacts to changes is also something that helps me set it up differently. All right. Um, Let's see, uh, Python is known to be slow. <laughs> yes, it is uh, known to be slow. Actually, Python 3.11 is going to be quite a bit faster. I mean, it's still not going to be 
C++ level fast, but it's still, uh, I think Python 3.11 has performance improvements of somewhere between uh, 10 and 60%. I'm actually going to record the video about it. So it's going to get a bit better. Um, Let's see, performance-wise, the Tabia asks, uh, discussing porting parts of a project to C, C++ because of performance issues. Is there a rule of thumb on how to decide when to optimize in Python versus when to use a compiled library? Uh, I don't know of a specific rule of thumb, to be honest, but I do think, um, you know, when you want to port part of your project to C++, also realize that this takes quite a bit of work to do because you're going to need to rewrite all that code in C++, which Python to C++ is not a perfect mapping. You may not have all the features available. So before you do that, try to think about uh, where the actual bottlenecks are in your code. And, um, uh, and it's, you know, there's often also ways to maybe rework the way that you're uh, solving your problem so you can stay in the Python domain and you don't have to move to C++. And often you can already make a lot of progress by uh, doing that first. Um, another thing is that is, yeah, you also have to think about, are you really going to, um, are you, how, how do you expect that you're going to change the code in the future? So uh, if you're already, uh, let's say, um, optimizing everything for performance. Well, uh, and then in one month later, you decide that you're going to throw out all the code and do things differently, then of course you've wasted a lot of time. So also be careful of the moment when you start optimizing. I think you should only optimize when basically you're kind of set in the way that your code is, uh, is structured and, uh, and then you can think about optimizing those parts if that's really important to you. All right. Um, Clearlax asks, hey, Arjan, what do you recommend uh, for a backend developer who wants to get started in uh, UI and UX? Um, I think uh, that's actually interesting because I think many backend developers, they become backend developers because, because they want to avoid doing UI and UX because that's like a real, really different kind of ball game, you know. Uh, you don't want your customers interacting with your code in any way because uh, that's, of course, very scary. So, yeah, if you want to get started in UI, UX, that means moving more to the front end. I think that's a lot easier than the other way around. Uh, going from front end, front end to back end is a lot more difficult because on the back end side, you often have to deal with uh, more asynchronous uh, things. You have more security, especially if you do, uh, um, um, if you have a more complex cloud-based setup, you're going to have different services, different systems running in the cloud with uh, ports that need to be opened and uh, all kinds of uh, authentication issues that you're going to need to deal with, uh, rate limiting, you know, backends in terms of complexity, I feel like it's a, it's, it's a lot harder than uh, front-end programming. But front-end has its own challenges. I mean, um, in my company, we spend really a lot of time on front-end, but mostly uh, on uh, more the, the user experience part. And this is actually really important. So if you want to get started with those things, um, I think in terms of writing code, that's not going to be a big issue. Um, depends on, of course, what language you want to use. If you, let's say you're doing your backend in Python and you don't have any experience with uh, TypeScript or JavaScript and you want to build a web app, then well, that's probably where you need to get started. Um, and um, yeah, start, start with the front-end framework and uh, try to build something simple first. And um, it, it really helps if if you're at working at a company and you have a product to to actually interact with customers and see how they're using the tool and where you can improve things. Um, I find it really helpful on the front end to think in terms of flows 
and optimizing those flows as much as possible, like putting yourself really in the position of your customer, your user, and thinking, okay, how are they going to do this particular task? Like, how are they going to log in to the system? Or how are they going to, if I don't know if you have an accounting system, for example, how are they going to upload an invoice? And think of those tasks and then think about, okay, how do you set up the user interface so that this is as simple as possible and as straightforward as possible? Um, so that's, I mean, we can probably also spend hours talking about uh, user experience and uh, user interface design, which uh, I like to th think about also from time to time. But there's uh, a lot to learn for sure. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, a few more questions. Uh, uh, um, all right. Okay, Stavros asks, uh, you're a full-time backend developer, three years of experience, only one year with Python. Uh, do you think it's better to focus on language agnostic skills first or uh, dive deep into Python? I think if you focus on language agnostic skills, then you also have to learn at the same time how to translate those things back into Python, which means that's extra mental space that you're going to need. Um, whereas if you start with Python, well, that's my feeling at least, it might be a bit easier because you can really focus on the specific thing in Python, which just makes learning the thing a bit easier. Uh, but then automatically you're going to realize, hey, I also uh, learned this uh, when I was uh, developing my backend application in Java and it was kind of similar. So I feel like diving in deeper is easier, especially if you have already some experience with, um, with programming languages. Uh, do you have your own libraries and utilities you reuse across projects? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, some of them, uh, I, I noticed that uh, they're being replaced by a standard solution. That always happens. You know, you build something yourself, but then after a while something comes out that's that's better, so you replace it. For example, we used a, our own uh, forms uh, library for uh, two or three years that we built in uh, JavaScript, but then I think uh, at the moment we're using React hook forms or something like that. Um, um, yeah, we we have a few uh, other libraries, utilities that we kind of reuse in different places, like uh, some uh, UI components that are useful in different kinds of apps. So that's, you always kind of build up this code base of things that you use over and over again. Stuff like generating uh, IDs of uh, various kinds. I have a couple of uh, utility functions for that, that kind of thing. Um, all right, uh, Soy Zero. Hey, Arjan, what's the best way to get familiar with existing code? Yeah, so that's, of course, something that happens quite a lot, right? That you are, um, uh, you start a new company, for example, and you have to get familiar with the existing code base. And where do you start? So I think there's a couple of uh, ways that, that that can work well. Um, we, in my company, kind of experience that also a couple of times from the other side, where, for example, we have an intern that started, so we have to make sure that the intern can, can actually get familiar with the code, and we really start to do it step by step. So um, as a first step in our company, we think it's important that, in this case, the intern knows the tool. So uh, we let them uh, play around with the tool, uh, see if they can figure out how things work. Because before you can dive into the code, it's important that you understand the concepts that are behind it. Uh, if you're, uh, I, I mentioned uh, an accounting example before. If you have an ac accounting uh, software, accounting platform, well then before you can actually dive into the code and, and understand what's happening, you also need to understand concepts like 
invoices and accounts and uh, um, um, you know the, the, those kind of things. So um, so you need to understand the concepts before you can make sense of the code. So that's the first step, I'd say. Um, and then what's what we do with uh, interns in my company is that we generally then pick like a really specific thing for them to do uh, and make it like extremely focused, extremely specific, like of uh, adding a very simple feature in a, like adding a, an alert to a dialogue or uh, changing uh, the layout of a page a bit, you know, very localized, uh, not using uh, lots of other pieces of the application code, but really localized in one specific area. And if you do it that way, it also means it's a bit easier to write tests for that because it's going to be very localized. So they can sort of uh, ease into the code that way and then slowly scale up. So you start with that very specific thing. Well, then you can move it up a notch and do something that has a bit uh, bigger impact on different areas of the code. Uh, so like adding a slightly bigger feature or refactoring uh, a, a, like a small area of the application code. And that's, you know, how you get to, uh, to roll into it and uh, understand better what's happening. All right, um, let's see, more questions. Um, Weiser has asked, what do you think is the best way to connect, for example, React front-end with the Python back-end? I've used WebSockets in the past, but I'm unsure if it's really worth it. It depends on the type of communication you need to do. Uh, most of the times, actually, uh, it's it's easiest to use uh, a REST API or of some sort to, to set up that communication. Uh, WebSockets are mainly useful if you need to do really fast two-way communication and you need to keep a connection open. Um, there's not that many applications where that is actually needed. So uh, in most cases, you can probably get started with, uh, with using um, uh, API uh, and doing HTTP requests. So that's, I think, the best way to start. If you don't know which of these two you're going to need, then start there because that's simpler. Um, but if you really need real-time communication, yeah, then, then WebSockets is, uh, is going to be a better choice. So, but only do it if you need that kind of aspect. Otherwise, use uh, REST APIs. That's kind of the standard way of doing it. All right, Antonis, greetings from Greece. Hey, well, uh, great greetings from the Netherlands, which is where I am. All right, uh, Patrick, can you make a tutorial about Strawberry GraphQL? Yeah, I looked into that a bit, and there's also a couple of other libraries that do something similar. Um, I do like GraphQL a lot, so I might do another video about that soon. All right, um, let's see, um, more questions. Uh, Charles asks, if you were to build an online store, for example, a local computer store, how would you go about it? Would you build it from scratch? If so, how would you, or would you go for like WordPress? <laughs> I would never, okay, never go for WordPress. <laughs> That's like the short answer, uh, because I really hate WordPress with passion. I, I did some sites with it in the past and it was like a complete mess. Maybe that was also my fault, but, you know, as soon as you start installing plugins and then you have to deal with uh, updating it to a new version, otherwise you're going to get hacked and then you're still going to ha get hacked. Um, I, I'm, I'm really not a big fan of, uh, of, of, of WordPress, especially not to build uh, just regular websites. I mean, WordPress is also made for building kind of a blog-like system. So uh, it's, it's kind of unintuitive to use it to build a website. So I... I honestly wouldn't uh, start there. So if you were to build an online store, well, I, I wouldn't build anything at all. I think there's lots of uh, platforms that are available that are much better than WordPress that provide like an all-in experience where you just have your uh, whole point of sale system and you can define your products. Um, WordPress is not really aimed for that, but I think uh, things like Shopify and uh, tools like that really allow you to get started really quickly. So I would get uh, I would get 
started there and see if you can uh, use that. I've, we're using at my company Squarespace, which also has integrations with all these different things, and that works uh, pretty well. All right, Shah asks, can you help a new class is added in the library, and how do I remove that class to interact with my code? The class is raising an error. I don't want to degrade the library. I'm not sure I completely understand what you mean. So you're using a library that has a class that uh, you're relying on, but it's raising an error. Um, I don't think it's going to work to uh, start editing the code in the library directly. Well, if you're using it, if it's uh, an open source library and it's published on something like uh, GitHub, you can do a fork and then you can actually modify the code. But that's definitely not where I would start. I mean, if if the if the class is problematic, I mean, it's either that's a bug. And in that case, if it's a, a, a repository in GitHub, you can post an issue and hope to sort it out uh, that way. Or perhaps uh, you're using it in a way that it's not intended to, and there's another way of using the library that won't result in that bug. So that's where I would start before you start editing yourself uh, things. Um, All right, uh, user 2563 asks, what's a good place to start contributing to open source projects? How would you go about it? Yeah, so I wouldn't just randomly pick an open source project and start writing code for it. I think the best kinds of uh, contributions to open source projects, at least from what I've seen in the past, I haven't done a ton of them, uh, by the way, myself, but uh, a few times, is that um, uh, when you're actually using those projects and you realize there's a limitation and you also have a solution for that and then you can supply a fix. So I say start with um, contributing to projects that you're already using and then you're also going to have more specific ideas to help them. Um, let's see. Uh, Zach, what are your favorite top three web framework? Um, yes, at the moment, well, we're kind of with the company uh, stuck on uh, React and Material UI and Next.js. So these, these tools is, uh, are what we're using. And we don't really feel like uh, throwing all that code out and changing all over again with uh, something like uh, Vue or uh, Svelte or whatever. Um, so I haven't spent a lot of time on the current state of the art of uh, web frameworks. It seems like uh, every few years there are a bunch of new ones. I must say Next.js has really saved us a lot of time. Um, before that, we kind of had a, our own build environment that was kind of patched together and doing our own server-side rendering setup, and Next.js really simplified that a lot. So that I definitely still recommend. All right, uh, Khan asks, in a Django environment for testing, do you prefer Django tests or PyTest? I haven't developed a lot with Django myself, so I can't really say, unfortunately. Um, let's see, uh, late to code uh, says, uh, point out that something to advance your sound quality, try to use a de-esser that removes the hardness of the s. Yeah, I have uh, played around with it a bit in more recent videos. So I'm actually cutting out some of the high end, but uh, I'll look into that more. And I might also enable that in the, um, in the live stream setting. So I'll look into that. Um, all right, uh, let's see. Sean asks, hello from Iran. Any plans to create videos about ACID or talking about system design and designing databases? Uh, I haven't really thought about doing those topics. Um, well, system design is a very broad uh, term, of course, that I, I guess you're talking then more about uh, the architecture side of it. Um, what, what I mainly want to do with my channel is that I cover the topics that are really on point for the audience and that are also at a practical level for people. And I, I don't think uh, many people are uh, designing database software, but maybe you're, re you're more referring to um, uh, designing the structure of a database. 
and this is something that's uh, yeah that's that that's a kind of different area than software design i'm definitely interested in that so i might uh, do a few videos about that in the future all right kevin asks everything in the class is public in python everything in the package is accessible are the methods for creating a black box package with just one class which serves as a facade yeah that's one of the issues with python is because it's so flexible and you can basically do anything with it with all these dunder methods that there's always a way to circumvent any protections that you put into place if you write underscores in front of your method names or instance variables then normally your uh, id is already going to warn you that uh, you're trying to access something that's internal so there's at least that there's also the idea i think that's the zen of python that also states that uh, the assumption is that developers are responsible which is <laughs> preposterous of course um, so it means that uh, the way that python is set up uh, gives a lot of power to developers but it also means you have a lot of responsibility now in terms of structure of course you can set up things so that you have a single class as a facade but in python it's really hard to uh, force the developer or to 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 really remove the possibility to to uh, to dive in deeper because with dunder methods and directly accessing everything you can basically do anything you want so that's hard uh, it's a disadvantage um, um, it also means Python gives a lot of flexibility, so there's the that's the other part of the coin. Um, but it actually also leads to problems with performance because that means on the interpreter level you also never know how somebody is going to use uh, the code. So uh, you have to basically take uh, into account all the possibilities, which means that often you can do a lot of performance optimizations. Um, you see that also, for example, in uh, data classes, where uh, if you use data classes, regularly, then uh, Python actually supports that you uh, define instance variables dynamically, right? You can just say in your code at any point, self dot whatever is some value. Uh, but uh, that also means that uh, you can do certain optimizations, uh, like uh, storing the references to those variables in a more optimized structure. So if you use slots, then uh, actually you are fixing uh, the instance variables that are going to be part of a class, but they're now stored in a slot structure, which makes access a lot faster. So there's always that kind of uh, that kind of balance. Um, all right, let's see. Uh, Akshat asks, you mentioned dry Python once. Will you ever make a separate video on that? Yeah. So um, uh, the don't repeat yourself uh, principle. Uh, I am actually covering that also in my online course, uh, but um, I'm, I might also do a video about that in the future. I think that's uh, a nice topic uh, to talk about. Yeah. Uh, Wonderboy asks, what do you think about creating a test, checking your Python level and where someone has gaps? Okay. So uh, that's more a question about uh, determining uh, where you are, let's say, in your programming skill. Uh, I actually had some ideas about doing that. Um, mm, it's also kind of hard, I think, to, to do it in a generic way, but uh, I don't have specific plans for the moment. I might do something on that in the future. Okay, Sportiel asks, hey, Arjan, how to handle libraries which have known security issues but are not getting fixed? Um, yeah, uh, so a couple of ways to deal with it. Don't use the library anymore <laughs> because then uh, you won't have that security issue anymore, hopefully, unless the replacement library uh, has the same issue. Uh, what you can also do is um, um, uh, trying to be more actively involved in that particular library if it's an open source library. So for example, you could in GitHub um, um, either post an issue or actually create a pull request with a fix for the security issue. If, you're, um, if you know the details of, uh, of what is happening, uh, I mean, that's the advantage of open source, right? That everybody can contribute. So if that's an important security issue to you, 
propose a fix. Um, and yeah, the other alternative is to um, to create, if possible, uh, you still want to use the library, but you can't change the code in the library. Perhaps there is a way to avoid the issue by uh, writing a wraparound that does some extra checks or, or whatever. But that's not always uh, possible. So you have to kind of choose. Okay, uh, Mayo asks, I'm at the stage of my life where I'm working on Python, but feels like not growing much. Past, I work on C++ and I love it, love Python too. Um, you're getting calls for C++, but hesitate to attend what to do. Yeah, so you're a bit st stuck on working on Python and you're not progressing that much. So. The question is how uh, how does it ha happen? Um, if you, if you're not progressing much in Python, um, perhaps you are working on uh, not the right kinds of uh, projects or ideas in Python, um, and it can this can happen. Like uh, for example, if uh, you just uh, work on on a project but uh, nothing is really happening anymore, that's uh, really helping you learn new things. What you can try to do is think a bit about where your comfort zone is in terms of programming and what you know about Python. Um, I mean, Python is an incredibly powerful language. It has many, many different features and different possibilities. So you can also try to approach it more from, let's say, your own personal learning path and think about, hey, this is like currently my comfort zone. This is like the stuff that I know at the moment. but what would make me feel slightly uncomfortable uh, developing in Python? Um, like, for example, have you created an API in Python? Uh, have you uh, worked with um, more advanced things like uh, generators or uh, protocols or things like that? Have you done things with uh, async IO or uh, multi-threading? And you know, pick an area like that and uh, pick a project that helps you train in that area and that will hopefully uh, help you get out of that rut. All right, Bernard asks, um, thanks for this, oh, you're welcome. They help immensely in my day-to-day -day work. That's good to hear. I have a question for you. How would you mock or patch a module used throughout your code to test it. Yeah, so mocking or patching, uh, it, that's like a specific direction that it goes in, right? You have your code that uses some other module. So if you want to test that code, then you're going to mock the module so that the code doesn't use the module that it depends on, and then you can test that code in isolation. So you need to provide that kind of isolated setting where you can write the test. Um, so if you have a module that you're using it and it's a third party module, you don't need to write tests for that module because the third party that developed the module is supposed to write tests for it. If you um, need to write tests for a module that you developed internally, well, then you can look at the code of the module, see which other dependencies that module has remove them via a dependency injection uh, constructs, and then you can test that module separately. So it's really about um, really ab about singling out the, the code that you need to test, remove all those external dependencies from it so that it becomes an, an isolated piece of code and then you can run tests on it. I, I hope that makes sense. I'm, maybe I'm misinterpreting uh, your question. Um, All right, uh, let's see, few more uh, questions. Oh, Golden Knight, thanks for all the videos. You're welcome, man. Uh, glad to be of help. Um, John, uh, what are common pitfalls do you experience when teaching Python to others? Are there some topics or concepts people usually teach in the wrong order? What I notice, especially when I talk about design patterns or design principles with uh, people is that um, developers sometimes 
uh, think about them in the wrong way, in the sense that they uh, look at their code and they think, okay, um, what design principles and what design patterns should I apply here to make things better? And I think that's the wrong way of thinking about it. Um, because that's going to lead to you trying to force using design principles and patterns in a way that possibly don't make a lot of sense. It's much better to, I think, take your thinking a step further and look at your code and think about, hey, how easy is it to change this code? How easy is it to read this code? Can, can I easily understand what is happening here? Or how easy is it to test this code? Uh, because those things are going to determine basically the, the quality of the work. And then design principles and design patterns are the tools that you use to make it easier to read, to make it easier to change or make it easier to test. So if you're a carpenter and you're going to build a house, you're, the carpenter is not thinking, well, uh, should I use a hammer for this or should I use a screwdriver or uh, what should I use? No, the carpenter is thinking in terms of uh, the structure of the house and, okay, what do I need in order to make sure that uh, the walls don't come uh, crashing uh, down after a couple of years? And then once he decides what to do in order to, uh, to make sure that it's robust, um, uh, then he just takes the tools and that he needs in order to do the job. And in the end, that's also how design patterns and design principles works, that tools to help you make code easier to read, easier to change and easier to test. That's how I approach it in any case. All right, uh, Sam, thanks so much for YouTube efforts. You're most welcome. Um, uh, let's see. Um, uh, Seth asks, I have a friend who never follows PEP8, doesn't use object-oriented programming in Python, and gives variables <laughs> crappy names like X, I, for pretty much every variable in the program. How should I help him? Uh, send him the link to my YouTube channel so we can start watching some of the videos. That could work. Um, other than that, well, uh, if, I mean, if you want to help your friend, you, you need to somehow make him realize why those things are important. Um, perhaps uh, they're never doing any projects where it's important, and then that's of course difficult. But uh, if so, if they're working in isolation, that's hard. If um, if you can do projects together or in in a team, then uh, quickly things are going to change because you're going to be dependent on other people, and they're going to be ways of defining how you work together. So. Um, I'd say push your friend to work more in a team of people and then he, she will quickly understand uh, uh, that this is needed. Now, uh, by the way, uh, doesn't use object-oriented programming, that's not necessarily a bad thing, right? I also use functional programming a lot, so that's not particularly a problem. But of course, uh, giving uh, variables uh, good names is really important. And um, I think a standard like PEP8 is also useful because then if you work in a team, at least uh, it's easier to uh, put your code together in one project because it's going to follow the same style. Um, yeah, Digred asked, have him debug you his own code a year late. That's also a great suggestion, uh, actually. Yeah. Uh, JD, how do you start using advanced features? How do you know you have to? Is it just practicing? Uh, to me, it kind of happens automatically. I mean, when you're trying to f solve a particular software problem, then uh, you're going to encounter limitations in the way that you can solve it. Sometimes it's not even possible to solve it with basic features. So, um, like, uh, f for example, I, uh, I I had a program where I replaced some classes by functions, but then I realized, hey, um, I need now to pass to change the signature of those functions before I can pass it to another part of the application. So then, 
uh, I started looking into that and then I found out uh, about partial function application. Um, so that's sort of how it happens to me. So I think the, the most important thing is to keep an open mind to those things. And uh, what I do find a lot with advanced features is that you sort of have to uh, encounter them uh, by chance because um, uh, it often happens when you want to solve a particular problem and with your current setup you're just not figuring it out because it's becoming a mess and then you start searching on uh, Stack Overflow or Google for answers and then you happen to stumble onto something and then you dive deeper and you think, hey, that could actually work as a solution to my problem. So that's, uh, that's, that's how it starts happening with me. Uh, what also happens sometimes is that I post a video about something and then I get a comment by somebody saying, why are you using this really basic thing? You should use this advanced uh, thing instead. And then I look into that and I think, oh, I actually have a good point. And then I do another video about that. So uh, that's also how it works sometimes with me. All right, Akshat, uh, what's your favorite dependency? Package Manager, uh, will you make a comparison video of the most popular, like Poetry versus pipenv? Yeah, I do like Poetry a lot. Um, I, I still, I mean, I haven't really written like very complex setups still in Python that require the use of Poetry. In my company, uh, we're also building a lot of tooling in, uh, in TypeScript and mods in Python. We're using Python mainly for um, uh, you know, data processing and uh, and things like that. So um, I will definitely uh, do a video about poetry at some point because I do think it's an important tool uh, to know about. And uh, I do like to have a video where I dive in a bit deeper. Uh, so that's coming. All right. Uh, did you write, uh, not a Python question, but something all programmers should learn continuously. How do you break a project down to discover uh, processes. Yeah, that's like one of the basic, like most important jobs of a computer scientist. Uh, that's it's analysis, analysis of problems and trying to understand how things are uh, connected and uh, what makes logical sense. Um, if you're not a computer scientist, this is sometimes hard to do because you don't understand the the, the, the technical uh, systems and the, the way that uh, things like uh, programming languages and cloud systems are set up and that, or databases. So uh, for people who don't have a computer science background, it's actually really hard to take a, a, a problem and then really structure it properly in terms of uh, processes and what are the, the let's say, the, the objects and what are the relationships between the objects and uh, what are the flows that happen in, uh, in, in a particular project and things like that. Um, how do you do it? Yeah, there's lots of standard uh, processes to do that, like uh, user stories and things like that. And then uh, you can do things like uh, interviewing people to try and understand what is going on um, or um, uh, watching as people do certain things or as people use certain systems to uh, figure out what they're doing and then trying to come up with a representation for that. Uh, and talking a lot with the different stakeholders, uh, obviously. But... Um, I mean, in my, in my company, we don't really have this kind of uh, issue where we have to build specific things for customers. So we're not really working in that way. But what we do quite often is that uh, we are thinking about a certain bigger feature in our platform and we try to understand how to break it down. And what we do is that we spend a lot of time with our users to understand what they do, what they need. We also ask them questions like, hey, if we had a system that worked like this, would that work for you? And then see how they respond and if we can refine that a bit. So taking that iterative process uh, helps us understand step-by-step step better how, uh, how a problem is structured and how we can best solve it.
All right, um, Mayo asks, I'm intermediate to advanced in Python, but the work I'm getting every day is not so challenging and you're not learning new technology. So your learning slows down. What should I do to grow? And how can I be in a better place? Okay, so your job is kind of limiting you in uh, your learning process. Now, yeah, that's that's a pity uh, because uh, it, it depends, of course, a bit on how much control you have over the work you get. Actually, often uh, companies are pretty happy if their employees want to learn more and become better because then they become more valuable. So I would definitely recommend speaking with your manager to see if there is a way to uh, change your work to match better with what you want to do to maybe add some some more uh, challenges for yourself um, another thing you can do but i mean that's also hard that depends on of course your personal situation is if it's possible to uh, start a sort of side project to keep your learning going um, perhaps contribute to some open source project or you know start a fun project in the evening or in the weekend. But only do that if you actually have the mental space for it because sometimes just doing your job already is a lot. Um, all right, uh, let's see. Uh, Rolando, how to learn type hinting the right way. Yeah, so I did a couple of videos about type hints. I might do a video that's a bit more focused on type hinting specifically. Uh, f for me, it's a question of uh, type hinting. Is I don't see it so much as something you should learn. It's more uh, something that's going to be a really helpful tool to you. So try to just make it um, uh, like a standard thing you do when you write code that you also write down the type hints. Um, like with uh, lots of things that you write down, if, for example, if I have a think about a problem, it helps me to write down uh, the problem and that helps me solve the problem. And for me, type hints work kind of in the same way where if I specify the type hints, I have to force myself to think about the structure of the data. And sometimes I discover that the structure is not clear or that I need to modify things or make things more coherent. And I think type hints are a really great way to achieve that. So use them as a tool. And that's uh, that's the most important thing. All right. Um, let's see, David, what languages or frameworks would you recommend for building APIs quickly but reliably? Django, Node.js, could you list some pros and cons of your top three? Yeah, so what we're using at my company for my API is uh, GraphQL on top of Node.js, and then we're using Apollo, which also does a lot of uh, work on the front end for uh, local caching and things like that, so that works really great. Uh, some, so that's a, a pro of uh, using that approach. Um, a con of uh, using uh, GraphQL is that uh, you also get some extra complexity in the sense that you need to set up resolvers and things like that in the back end, which might be a bit more complex than just setting up endpoints. So it's it's nice, it can do a lot of things, but it's also a bit more complex. Um, if, you, uh, if you want to build a Python backend, then I think Fast API actually works really, really well. It's, uh, it's really a great, uh, great tool that also allows you to get started quickly. Uh, for my um, uh, course, online course backend uh, that processes, that generates invoices and stuff like that, I'm using Fast API uh, as, uh, uh, as the, the, let's say, the library to to build the API with, and that works just really well. So um, that's uh, that's really nice. Um, okay. Chris, uh, do you believe in using dedicated test engineers uh, or developers? And what are your factors in? It depends. <laughs> okay. Okay, so you blocked me basically from saying it depends, right? Using dedicated test engineers and developers. I think on the one hand, it's nice that as a developer, you also write tests. 
because that forces you to think about your program in terms of how you're going to test it. And that means you are going to be, um, uh, let's say, more quickly using uh, good design principles and making uh, your code a bit easier to manage. So writing tests is a good thing. Um, but sometimes as a developer, uh, you kind of uh, stuck in your, your own little world and you lose the overview of what you're actually doing. And then it's important that there are people that can take a step back and look at it from a different point of view. Especially when you're writing tests, you need to think of edge cases or different ways that flows are going to work or basically testing requires you sometimes to think a bit outside of the box. And I've noticed uh, with quite a few developers that they tend to focus on the happy flow, building the happy flow, and then, you know, it works. We built the happy flow, we tested the happy flow, but they didn't think about what happens if the user does this stupid thing here or uh, clicks a hundred times on the button, you know, that, that kind of stuff. And that often uh, breaks things in your software. So that's the kind of place where I think test engineers or having a sort of Q&A department can really help. Um, so I do believe they, they are valuable, actually, um, mostly because they help you look at the code uh, uh, more objectively. And that's sometimes hard to do as a developer, especially if you're a large team and you're working on a very specific thing, then having a Q&A department with uh, really software testers is, uh, is going to be helpful. Um, all right, uh, Nasser asks, did you work with uh, programming languages like Java? Yeah, I did quite a lot actually in the 90s. Uh, during my studies, I well, I when I studied computer science, I think this was just before they introduced Java in the program. So I did a lot of uh, my studies in Pascal and C and C++. But um, I did work a lot with Java during my PhD, actually, where um, we were building some... Uh, uh, um, yeah, we, we were working on a sort of dialogue system, like a chat agent, and we, I was using Java to, to build part of that. So I worked with it uh, quite a bit. And I also did some uh, teaching actually with Java, but I didn't build like huge applications uh, with it. Uh, John, do you use Tox for testing your code? Not yet, but I am interested in it. So uh, I might do a video about that. Thanks for the suggestion. Um, let's see, uh, YBL uh, asks, does coding for a long time make your hair turn gray faster? Because I'm sure turning into Gandalf. Yeah, Gandalf is actually a, um, a, a, a very experienced Python developer. This is uh, how he got his gray hair. Um, if you do uh, TypeScript developing, then your hair actually turns white. So uh, that's the next step, I think, in your career to take. And as you can see, I'm also uh, getting uh, lots of gray hairs nowadays, but I think this is mostly due to my kids, actually. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, Andy asks, any thoughts on uh, Julia? I want to get into data science and try it, but most of the courses are Python-based, so I find it hard to learn. I haven't uh, spent a lot of time on Julia, so I can't really say anything useful about it yet, but I might uh, look into it. Okay. Uh, Pedro, hi, Aaron, can you make a video for using uh, object-oriented program with vectorial operations, NumPy, for example, efficiently? Uh, thanks for all the teaching. Yeah, you're most welcome, of course. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. I did a video where I used some um, uh, uh, like Dunder methods to have some basic uh, support. Um, I haven't focused too much in my uh, in my code examples on optimizing performance. Uh, so this would uh, uh, w would mean that I would need to spend some time on that. 
and that kind of conflict sometimes with using object-oriented programming because, because classes and methods and inheritance uh, that always uh, leads into some overhead. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll think about it and I'll think about what is a good way of uh, representing that in a video. Uh, Bernard, you mentioned you used to develop computer graphics applications. Which ones uh, were they? Yeah, they were not like uh, uh, big applications used by the industry like Unity or something like that. We, we did work on a, um, a, like a graphics engine, but mostly for research, uh, which uh, was called VHD++ at the time, uh, Virtual Human Director, I think that was the name of it. And that was basically a combination of um, uh, C++ code on the lower level and the Python scripting engine on top of it. And we used that mainly to develop uh, demos where we incorporated uh, hardware like uh, motion tracking systems to control uh, virtual characters in a 3D environment and uh, stuff like that. Um, that was pretty interesting actually. but. Uh, all that code is now basically uh, uh, gone. Nobody uses that anymore. Um, all right, uh, you're asking, are you thinking of uh, helping your student get or find jobs? Well, I was thinking of maybe, uh, I, I, you know I have a Discord server. I was thinking about maybe create a place there to, to help people and uh, like post uh, uh, that they're looking for a job or maybe uh, al allow a place for companies where they can have job postings, things like that. I haven't really thought about it in detail for what, uh, what really is going to be helpful, but uh, I'll think about that. All right, so uh, before I'm going to close off, um, just want to do a final check that there are no more questions in the uh, the post. Um, oh, Arjun, nice name by the way, uh, says do video on Django channels and web sockets. Uh, yes, good idea. I will uh, look into it. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to close off for tonight. Uh, really enjoyed uh, chatting with you again. Um, if you uh, want to learn a bit more about, uh, you know, I'd, in, in my videos I do a lot of uh, work on analyzing code and trying to improve things and uh, uh, thinking about, uh, you know, how do you approach that? How do you uh, improve your code? Uh, I have created a workshop, which is a free workshop. You can get this at arian.code slash diagnosis. Um, it's about half an hour. Uh, I'm in that workshop. I look through uh, some actual production libraries um, that uh, you might actually use uh, yourself and uh, do an analysis of the code and also give you some ideas of how to do that. So um, if you want to check that out, it's free. Go to iron.codes, diagnosis and uh, uh, check it out. So thank you so much for joining tonight. I'm going to do another live stream next month, so uh, hope to see you then. And uh, I'll uh, post a uh, uh, topic uh, in YouTube community where you can uh, any follow-up questions if you like. So have a great evening and talk to you soon. Bye-bye.